My name is Meta Atamel. I'm a developer advocate at Google based in London. Hi, I'm James Ward. I'm a developer advocate in Colorado. First of all, thanks for being here so early in the morning after the after party if you went there. I'm impressed. Yeah. <laughs> uh, today, we're going to be talking about multi-regional apps on Google Cloud. Uh, so when you think about multi-regionality, there's actually two aspects to that. The first one is running your code in a multi-regional way, and that's what we're going to cover here today in this presentation. But the second aspect is uh, storing your data in a multi-regional way. Unfortunately, we won't have time to cover that today, uh, so sorry about that, because once we went through figuring out what it takes to run your code in a multi-regional way, we realized it's really complicated, maybe much more complicated than it should be. So we have just enough time to cover that. But the good news is that we talked to the solution engineers guys at Google, who is really interested in this topic, and they're going to come up with some solution papers in the next few months on running your code multi-regionally and, and storing your data multi-regionally uh, so that um, people can get an idea on what to do on both fronts, because it doesn't make sense to have your code uh, running multi-regionally when your data is in a single region. So with that, uh, first let's talk about why we should even care about multi-regionality. So James, you want to tell us more about that? Yep. So. Um, we uh, and many others have data centers all around the world, and so we, uh, we have this compute spread all over the place. And so why would we actually want to have all these data centers all around the world? So I want to give an example of um, New York to Tokyo. Does anybody know how many miles it is from New York to Tokyo? Guesses? 6,737 miles. I think that's like straight line. So it's a lot of miles, right? But we all think like, hey, you know, our, our data is traveling via light, and light is really fast. But it actually turns out light isn't really fast at that kind of scale. So anybody know how long it takes light to travel from New York to Tokyo and back? Guesses? It's actually 72 milliseconds. So just to get light from New York to Tokyo and back takes 72 milliseconds. And that may not seem like a lot. That's you know, only 72 milliseconds. But in a typical web application, and the way that TCP works, we're actually making these back and forth things all the time, over and over and over, just to load like one web page. And so this adds up and stacks on top of each other to create a lot of really high latency for our users. So if our data center is in New York and our user is in Tokyo, then this latency can really add up and create a, a bad experience for them. So by, by moving the, the actual service of what we're serving, the app that we're serving, as close as we can to the user, we can really significantly reduce the latency that our users experience. So that's, that's one big reason for why we may want to be multi-regional in our application, is just to reduce latency in our application for our users. And then this also definitely comes into play as we're communicating across microservices. So if we have microservices, and one is in New York and one is in Tokyo, then those microservices are going to have high latency communicating with each other as well. So not necessarily just about user experience. It could be service integration experience, too, and latency around that. So then uh, another reason to be multi-regional is just to be able to, uh, to protect ourselves against outages. Um, a lot of times when outages happen, uh, they should be pretty isolated, but sometimes they can uh, propagate up. And these can be because an engineer like me makes a mistake, or it could be because of some major ca uh, catastrophic act of God. And so by being able to be multi-regional, we can now uh, avoid some of those issues around outages. Uh, so let's talk about how we actually uh, would build a multi-regional architecture to handle these scenarios, to reduce latency, and to, uh, to deal with, with outages. So we're going to start at what we call the zone level. So the zone level, you can think of a zone essentially as an isolated data center that is protected uh, from, from other, other outages or other issues in other zones. So it's, it has this isolation. So uh, it is essentially a data center with its own network, its own power, its own backup power, all those things together. 
And so we're going to start with the zones. Our apps always will run in a specific zone. And so we need that's essentially get down to the server level. We've got to run on a server at some point, and that server is going to be in a data center, which you can think of as a zone. Then we have this idea of aggregating together different zones into a region. And so if you want to, your application to be able to be resilient across, uh, across a region, it needs to exist in multiple zones, because uh, potentially a whole zone could go out if there's something crazy that happens in the data center, or uh, somebody makes a mistake in a network configuration or something like that, can take out a whole zone. So if you want to be resilient, at the regional level, you need to be spread across multiple zones. Uh, and so we have many different regions that you can choose from. And uh, there's US West. There's a couple in US West. There's uh, Tokyo. There's Europe. All sorts of different regions that you can choose from. Um, but region is just an aggregation of multiple zones for your application to run in. So we've got these, we've got these multiple regions. And that's great, but we don't want to tell users in Tokyo, hey, you need to go to fuutokyo.com, and users in Europe to say, oh, you got to go to fuuEurope.com. Right? That's not going to work. We want to send them to foo.com. And so then we have to have some way to be able to give them a single endpoint that then will route traffic to their nearest region that they're in. And this is what a global load balancer does, is it provides us a single IP address, and thus a single domain name, that we can give to our users or to our services. And it then looks at the request and where it's coming from, and will route it to the, the closest location uh, and make sure that what it's routing it to is up and able to handle requests. So then our users are happy because uh, our users in Tokyo automatically go to the Tokyo region service. Uh, so great. So that's, that's how our global load balancer works. But let's actually take a look at what this actually looks like. So um, I'm going to start here. I've got, this is going to get a little tricky because we're running two different windows. Our, our Chrome browser on the left is running, actually running, the, the browser itself is actually running on a, on a virtual machine in Europe. And then our Chrome browser on the right is a virtual machine running in Oregon. So left Europe, right Oregon. Maybe we should have done that the other way <laughs> geographically, but um, that's OK. OK, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to load an application here. And you'll see the address for this application, this 35, 244, right? We're going to load that same address in the other one as well. But what this app is doing is when it loads, it figures out where the application is actually running. So not where the user is coming from, but where the application is actually running. So this application is running in Belgium. So it's in the Belgian region. And then it tells us how the ping time that it took, how long it took for the client, which is also in Belgium in this case, to make the request to the region in Belgium and get a response. So it was pretty quick, 49 milliseconds. And then it shows us a nice picture of Belgium, of Saint Grislaine, Belgium, um, there. Um, OK, so that's great. But what we're going to do now is go to that same exact address, but we're going to do it from Oregon. And now the app says, hey, I'm running in Oregon. And we get pretty good latency there, 121 milliseconds. And we see a weird picture of a building from the Dalles in, in Oregon. Um, so that's great. Same address. See, that's the key with this whole thing. Is we went to the same address, and that address routed us to the region that was closest to where our request was coming from. So now we're able to get much lower latencies. If I were in my Oregon virtual machine to go directly, so I'm not going to go through the load balancer, I'm going to go directly to my Europe region, we try to load that, you'll see that now my, much, my latency is much higher, right? So I'm, I'm now accessing, I just bypassed the, the load balancer, and now my latency is much higher, up to 361 milliseconds. So not, not terrible, but you know, if we have to stack a bunch of requests on top of each other, this is going to get really slow really quick. So let's go back through the load balancer here and see things are much faster when we access the region that's closest to us. There's one other thing here that we can do is we can go in and let's uh, simulate a catastrophic uh, disaster in Oregon. So I'm just going to actually do that by turning off all my instances in Oregon. 
So we'll turn all those off. It'll take a second for them to shut down. But now, if we go back, and now we try to access uh, from Oregon this application, and we'll have to wait a second for them to actually shut down. But what's going to happen is it's going to now say, like, I can't access the stuff that's closest to you, so I'm instead going to route you to a server error, <laughs> or it shouldn't have. There we go there to we Belgium. Go. <laughs> <laughs> so it's now routing us to Belgium instead of that that service that was down. Uh, so now we get that that fault tolerance across those regions just built in, and of course things are going to be much slower while that that uh, organ system is down, but at least it hasn't crashed and, and is just not uh, not working for users. So there we go. That's that's how we now have our global load balancer that is able to route stuff to the closest to, uh, the closest application to the user and handle outages across those. Okay, and let's go back and scale that back up so that future demos work, work. just fine. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Cool. So that was good uh, for the high-level description of what an app should look like that's uh, tolerant and multi-regional. But how do you do this on Google Cloud? Um, before we talk about that, we need to talk about how you can run code on Google Cloud, because it's a little bit complicated. There's a lot of options. So let's go through those options first, one by one, look at the options that you have when you run your code, and then take a quick look at how to turn that code running in a single region and make it multi-regional. Now, let's take a look at this from low level to high level. Uh, at the lowest level in Google Cloud, there's compute engines. These are basically virtual machines running um, Windows or, or Linux instances in a single region. Um, you basically choose the CPU you want, the memory you want, the storage you want, and the uh, VM is ready in 30 seconds. And then once you have it, you can install whatever you want. It's yours. It's not maintained, so you have to take care of software updates and everything. Um, but it's yours to keep, and it's mostly for applications that you already have running in a VM. You want to move them to Google Cloud, you would mostly use Compute Engine, right? Then uh, if you made the switch to containers, from VMs to containers, you probably heard about Kubernetes, which is an open source project to manage containers. And you also probably heard about Istio, which is also an open source project to manage the traffic to your containers. Um, in Google Cloud, with a single, single G Cloud command, command, you can get a Kubernetes cluster with Istio enabled. So with just a single command, you have a cluster running with Kubernetes and Istio. And that's where you would run your containerized applications with full flexibility. So whatever you want to do with your containers, scale them, connect them. E Kubernetes gives you all that flexibility, and Kubernetes Engine is the place to run that on Google Cloud. Now, with flexibility comes a lot of um, complexity, um, because Kubernetes has its own uh, vocabulary, like pods and deployments and services that you have to learn. Uh, so there can be a, a lot of complexity there. Uh, we introduced something called Cloud Run a couple of days ago, which is a really easy way of running containers in a serverless way. So in Cloud Run, you basically point to your container, and then you just say, deploy this container and scale it for me. Um, and what Google Cloud does is that it basically deploys a container, routes the traffic to the container, takes care of scaling down to zero when no one uses it, scales it up to whatever you set uh, automatically. So all those details of running that container and scaling up and down is taken care of for you. And you don't have to deal with the low-level details like Kubernetes and Istio. Everything is like kind of abstracted away from you. Um, but maybe you don't even want to care about containers because you know containers, even though they're nice abstractions, you still need to worry about writing a Docker file. And you need to worry about your dependencies and make sure that your Docker file is actually optimized so it doesn't take too long to load your uh, container and things like that. Um, so you maybe as an application developer, you want to deal with source code and not the infrastructure. And for that, there's App Engine. App Engine has been around for a long time uh, and it's kind of serverless before serverless was uh, popular. Uh, in App Engine, you write your code, deploy it, and you still get kind of serverless features like scaling down to zero and scaling up easily. But you also get um, traffic splitting, versioning, and other features like dashboards and things like that for free. And finally, maybe you don't even care about applications. You just want to write some piece of code in a function, define the input and the output, and define what triggers that function, and let Google manage the rest. So for that, there's cloud functions. So that's for source-based, event-driven applications, right? 
So this is the stack that you have when it comes to running code on Google Cloud, and it's up to you basically where you want to be in the stack, the low level at Compute Engine or, or at the highest level at, at Cloud Functions. But the key thing is that all of these options, they're basically, they're always running in a zone in a region. So they're not really designed to be multi-regional by default. Uh, they're not even designed to be regional by default. They're designed to run in a single spot, uh, single zone in a region. So you have to do work yourself to make it multi-regional. And at the high level, this is how it looks like. So for Compute Engine, there's Google's global HTTP, HTTPS load balancer. So there's really good support for that. So you would basically set that up. So you would deploy two VMs in two different regions, and you would set up the load balancer um, in front of them, and, and that there's good support for that. Now, if you're on Kubernetes Engine and it's still land, things are a little bit co more complicated. So there's so if you're running Kubernetes on Google Cloud or, or on-prem or, or, or some other place, there's Kubernetes Federation, and there's two versions of that that we'll talk about. Uh, there's a tool called kubemci that helps you to set up an HTTPS load balancer in front of your Kubernetes clusters that we'll talk about as well, but it's a temporary solution. There is something called multi-cluster ingress with GKE that we announced last next, but it's not ready yet, so you cannot use it today. <laughs> And finally, if you are using Istio for your traffic management, there is a way to configure Istio so that it spans multiple clusters, and that's also an option. So this story there is complicated, and hopefully we'll get to the bottom of it at the end of this presentation. Um, and then for Cloud Run and App Engine and Cloud Functions, unfortunately, Google Cloud doesn't support any native solution today. Uh, so what that means is that you need to deploy them yourself in multiple regions, and you need to figure out a load balancer in front of them yourself something like Apigee or Cloudflare or Nginx or something like that. But we'll talk about all of these in detail as we go through the presentation. Now, first, let's talk about Compute Engine. Now, um, if you want to deploy code to Compute Engine, one wrong way of doing that is that you get a VM, you install whatever you want on the VM, and you repeat the process, right? Uh, this works for like maybe five VMs, but if you have to manage like thousands of VMs, it doesn't work, it doesn't scale, and it's error prone, right? What you need to do is, first of all, you need to create what's called an instance template, and from the instance template, you need to create an instance group to manage these VMs, but to get to the instance template, you need to do a little bit of work, so let's go through that. Let's see how to create an instance template first. First, you start with a base image. Uh, Google Cloud has a lot of base images that you can rely on uh, for Windows and Linux, or you can also import your own image if you want into your project and use that as well. But either way, you start with an image and you get a VM running. Uh, from the VM, uh, you can install other things that you need on that VM. And once it's ready, you can take a snapshot of, of that VM. So the snapshot basically takes the snapshot of the, the disk that the VM is um, attached to. And then you can use that disk for, to create other VMs. But the snapshot is uh, project scoped, meaning you can only use that within the same project. Usually you have multiple projects and you want to be able to share this snapshot with, with multiple projects. So for that, you create something called custom image. So custom Im image is basically a snapshot that you can share globally with multiple projects. Um, but you don't usually take the custom image and run it as it is because different regions and, and different uh, apps need different configuration. So what you usually do is that you take a, a custom image and you use startup scripts and you, you use metadata service to get configuration and setup into your custom images so that they are customized for the region that you're running. And from then, you can create an instance template, right? So that's kind of like the journey <laughs> to instance template. So instance template basically kind of combines the custom image and the startup scripts and the metadata together into a template that you can use to create groups of instances. Uh, and finally, you can use Cloud API um, to create uh, these um, instance groups. So the Cloud API, you can use it from gcloud command line tool. Um, so when you use gcloud com command line tool, it uses the API. Or you can use the client libraries in any language you want. Or you can use the REST API directly if you want. But either way, you're going through the Cloud API to create these groups. So from the instance template, we cre you create something called instance groups. These are basically groups of VMs that are managed for you. Um, they are based on a template, on an instance template. Um, and these instance groups, basically, once you create an instance group, it manages the VMs for you. So if a VM goes down or if it's not healthy, it will bring it down and create a new one for you. 
You can also set auto scaling on these instances. Um, so you can set, for example, the min and the max size of, of these instances. Uh, as you've seen in James's demo, you can either scale down to zero manually or scale up, or you can also set auto scaling. Um, but the key thing is that although this is still a single zone or multiple zones, but they're still within the same region. So it's not multi-regional yet. And as I mentioned, you can hook up an auto scaler to your instance group and you can set policies on that. Uh, so you can say, for example, I want to scale from 0 to 20, uh, and I want, to be able, I want to do this with CPU. So it will, the auto scale will look at the average CPU, and it will scale up and down. Uh, it will basically instruct instance group to scale up and down, depending on the policy that you have. But all of this is still single region. So you might be wondering, like, why are you showing me all this? Because it's single region, and James will tell us about that. <laughs> yep. So when we create our instance groups and our instance templates, that's in a single region. So we need to be able to take that to multiple regions and then put the load balancer in front of that. So the solution is to put the load balancer in front of our multiple regions. So we need to set up the instance templates, which can span multiple regions. But then we need to run our instance group. So we'll run an instance group in East uh, or West in, in Europe. So we'll run our instance groups every region that we want to provide service in. And then we put the global load balancer, the Google load, load balancer, in front of that. So the way that we do that is we first need our global IP address. So we go and reserve a global IP address for our load balancer. So the load balancer will have a single reserved IP address that we use across the whole world. And then we set up a forwarding rule. So the request is going to come into the load balancer, which is a machine running in a data center somewhere. And then it needs to know what to do with that request. And so we tell it, hey, here's what you do. You need to actually call this thing over here. And so that goes through a proxy. So we set up a proxy, which is going to allow us to do some URL maps. And ultimately, the proxy is going to point to our backend service, which is running in a specific region. So we're going to tell our load balancer about all the regions that our application is up and running in and define those all as backend services underneath the load balancer. And then those actually can, can forward the request to our app that's actually running within a region and then within a zone. So those are our actual backends. So the path that this goes through on the internet is that the end user is going to make a request ultimately to an IP address. That IP address is going to resolve to the region that is closest to them. I think we use like multi-homing or something like that to, to magic tricks with multi-homed IP addresses to make that work. But that IP address routes them to the closest region where there's a machine, the load balancer running, that's going to handle that request, look up the information for where to forward, where it can forward that uh, request to, and then try to get that request forwarded to the region that is closest to the user. Uh, and then we can set up, we have to set up firewall rules which allow the load balancer to talk to our instance group. Uh, so we need to make that request possible. We in our setup just exposed through the firewall rules access to the world to our backend services. Uh, and you probably wouldn't want to do that. You probably want to restrict it so that only the load balancer can actually make requests to your actual backing instance groups. So you set up your firewall rules. And then you set up a health check. So the health check is a URL that the load balancer is going to be periodically calling. And then that's what tells the load balancer that that region is good and can handle requests. So that's how we set up the load balancer. But let's see what it actually looks like here. So in the, the Google Cloud Platform console, uh, first we're going to go check out our, let's go to our instance templates. So you see that we have a couple different ones here, but the one that uh, we showed you already was this one. And so this was where we went and created the template of how to create instance groups in the multiple regions. <coughs> so there's a few things that, um, that we have specified in here. Uh, there, there is the, the firewall configuration that is specified through this network tag, HTTP tag. There's the container image that we're pulling down from the, uh, the container repository, uh, image information, so what size CPU to use, and that sort of thing. So that's our instance template. And then from there, we created our instance groups. So there's the instance group in Europe 
that we are using and the instance group in Oregon that we are using. And so if we go into one of these instance groups, we can see this is really just created, uh, instances created from a template and potentially auto-scaled. So you'll see it's pointing to that instance. Auto-scaling is off in our case. Uh, and then we have the actual instances, the two instances that are up and running the application um, there. So those are our actual underlying instances for this. So that's the, the structure. Instance template, which allows us to create instance groups in multiple regions, and then the actual running instances that are running within zones. OK, so now let's take a look at the, the load balancer configuration. So that's under network services load balancing. And the load balancer that we've set up uh, that you've just seen is called WebMap. And here you'll see our public IP address. So that was the one, if you remember, that I loaded uh, at first in those, those browser windows. So that's our public load balancer IP address, the single IP address that we use to access uh, everything behind the load balancer. And then you'll see that I'm, I'm giving it the instance groups, the, the Europe and Oregon instance groups. And then it knows how to then route the traffic as you saw. And then we can go check out like our health check here to see what that's doing. That's going to a URL slash ping and some parameters around that health check. So that's how we put together the load balancer along with the instance templates and instance groups to make this not just a regional application, but now a multi-regional application. Great. And the key thing is that uh, there's all native support here from Google. Um, so we didn't have to use anything external. And you get the geo load balancing for free. The global load balancer does figures out where the user is and routes the request to the nearest instance group. So that's the that's the key thing. Now for Kubernetes engine and Istio, things are a little bit more complicated. So let's go through that. Um, so the landscape is that. So if you are running Kubernetes, there used to be a feature called Kubernetes Federation uh, version one. Um, there was a group that worked on that for a year or so, I think. And then it was abandoned because it didn't like it didn't uh, handle a lot of use cases and it wasn't stable and all that kind of stuff. And now there's a V2 coming up. There's another group that's working on that. And last time I checked, it's still evolving. I haven't seen. I think it's either alpha or beta stage, but I haven't seen it being used in production yet. But if you are using Kubernetes inside or outside Google Cloud, you should keep an eye on Kubernetes Federation. Maybe V2 will get to the final stage, and maybe it will be. Uh, be, you will be able to use it. But as of today, I didn't feel like it was something that you can use in production. Now, in GKE, in Google Kubernetes Engine, um, the clusters are actually deployed in a single zone, in a single region. Um, there is something called regional GKE clusters, meaning you can have a GKE cluster spanning multiple zones, but those are still in a single region, right? But one thing that you can do is that you can um, you can create two clusters in two separate regions yourself. And you can kind of load balance between them if you want. Uh, this works, but it's manual, and you need to basically it's two independent clusters that you need to manage, and you need to load balance, set up some kind of load balancer yourself. Now, there's a tool called uh, multi cluster ingress, and there's a command line tool called kubemci that's open source and it's supported by Google. And if you look at Google GKEs, um, documentation page on kubemci, right at the top, there's a red font message that says, this is only temporary, don't, don't use it. <laughs> but it, it, uh, I'm going to show it here today for, because of unfortunate reasons that I'm going to explain. But basically, that, that's a tool that you can use to set up two clusters in two regions and load balance them using Google's uh, HTTPS load balancer. Kind of like Compute Engine, but it kind of automates that for you. So you don't have to do all those steps yourself. KubeMCI does it for you. Uh, so you might wonder, like, OK, if KubeMCI is temporary, then what am I going to use? And ultimately, you will be, you'll be using something called multi-cluster ingress controller, or MCI, that we announced last next in July. But we, last time I checked, it's still in progress. And I, I asked the PM, can, can we have a version that we can play with? And I, I couldn't get one yet. So it's in progress, but eventually that will replace KubeMCI, and if, maybe next year I'll show you a demo of that, but not today. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about KubeMCI today, but keep in mind that it's, gonna, it's a temporary solution until the other MCI, which is implemented using ingress control, will, comes along. 
Now, kubemci, it's a command line tool that you can use to load balance between two separate clusters deployed in multiple regions. But there are some restrictions. Uh, the, each service must be configured exactly the same way, meaning that you, you need to have the same name, you need to, they need to be in the same namespace names, and they need to expose the same ports, and they need to be uh, the service type node port yeah, in, in Kubernetes. So this might be limiting for you, but you have to basically do this in order to use this tool. Um, and the way to do it, I, I'll just show you some gcloud command line tools quickly so you have an idea how to set this up. First, you need to create your clusters. So in Google Cloud, you just use gcloud container clusters create, give it a name, define the number of nodes, define the zone. So this creates a, a cluster in Europe. Then you do the same for US. So you have two clusters running, one in Europe, one in US. Then to get your code into Kubernetes, um, you create a deployment. So you create a deployment uh, YAML file with the, your container image and stuff like that. And you have your code running. Then you need to expose your pod, pod to the outside world. So for that, we're going to use a node pod service because that, that's what kubemci forces us to do. So we do that as well. Uh, and then you need to let kubemci manage your cluster. And to do that, you basically get the credentials of your, of your cluster and save to a kubeconfig file. So I'm getting the credentials of my Europe West and the credentials of my US West, save to a file. And then finally, um, I need a static IP for my ingress. Uh, so I reserve that static IP on Google Cloud. And then I point, um, I create an ingress resource for, for my cube MCI, right? So I, I basically create a YAML file that defines my ingress that I'm going to show in the next slide. And I point to my project, and I point to my cube, uh, cube config, the configuration for my, for my MCI uh, config. So once you do that, uh, the cube MCI can list like the ingress IP for you if you want. You can see the status, and then, then you get an IP, and you can crawl that IP and get your cluster, right? So these are kind of the steps. And just to show you, I am not going to show you the deployment or the service, because these are Kubernetes things that you, sh you probably know about already if you're running Kubernetes. But the YAML file for the ingress kind of looks like this. You basically say, this is my service name. This is the port that I want to expose my you know, external load balancer, basically. And then you add a couple of annotations. So you are saying, this is my static IP name. So this is the IP name like, that I, ha I, I had when I created my static IP in Google Cloud. And also the, an ingress class that tells me this is a multi-cluster setup. So once you have this, you can expose these two um, clusters in two separate regions using ingress with kubemci. And um, yeah, let me show you this. I mean, it's not going to be too different than what we had before. But if I come back here, Instead of going to Google Compute Engine instance, I'm going to GKE instance. And one thing that you'll realize is that this is on HTTP, not HTTPS, because I was too lazy to set it up, sorry. <laughs> uh, if I come here, then it's the same kind of thing. Like I, from Europe, I go to Europe. From US, I go to US. And if you look at the configuration, uh, first of all, the Kubernetes engine, I have two clusters. Um, one is, where am I, Europe West? And the other one is, where am I, US West? So these are my Kubernetes clusters. And if you look at the services, I have the ingress services and the node port services that are also exposed that I need. And if you look at the load balancers, so this was the load balancer for, um, for Compute Engine, but I also have a load balancer for the Cube MCI, and that's pointing to the ingresses, the backend services, basically, in Kubernetes. So that's, that's how it is. And so that's Kubernetes um, without Istio. But if you are running many microservices on Kubernetes, and if you want to manage the traffic to your microservices, then it makes sense to use Kuberne uh, Istio. And normally, Istio runs um, in a single region. For example, there's this um, book info application that you, you probably have seen on uh, Istio. It's a sample application that has multiple microservices, and usually these are deployed in a single region. But there is a way to set uh, Istio in a multi-cluster way, where it can span multiple clusters. And these clusters can be in multiple regions. So in this case, for example, we have one of the microservices, reviews v2, um, running in US West, and another one running in US East. So you can do this kind of setup in multi-cluster Istio. Um, I tried this. It works. Uh, and if you go to Istio documentation page, 
there's a couple of different flavors that you can use to set this up. Uh, but we won't go through it here today because it's like a little bit complicated and um, too many steps. But it's something that actually works and then you can use as well, right? Okay, so that wraps up the Kubernetes Istio part, and let's uh, so talk about Cloud Run and App Engine and Cloud Functions land. Yep, moving up the stack. So if you want a higher abstraction level, uh, instead of doing GCE or Kubernetes, you want to move up to Cloud Run or App Engine. Let's talk about how that works. So for our serverless compute, uh, there's different abstraction layers, um, Cloud Functions, App Engine, and Cloud Run. And the way that you set up these to be multi-regional varies a little bit, so I want to run through that. So if you're on App Engine, when you create an app in Google Cloud, it's tied to a specific project, and you can only have one app, one App Engine app, in a given project. And each app has a single region. So in App Engine, there's this correlation of one project has one app, which is tied to a single region. So if you want to be multi-regional with App Engine, what that means is you need to set up multiple projects and each pro one project for each region that you want to be in. So that's what we have to do for App Engine to be multi-regional. For Cloud Functions, uh, we can have multiple functions in a given project, so that's good. But each actual function in our project is tied to a specific region. So if we want to have a multi-regional function, then we need to have multiple instances of that function, multiple functions essentially in different regions. And then for Cloud Run, um, that will also be true, but today Cloud Run I think only works in central, the central region. So today only one region uh, for Cloud Run, so it can't quite be multi-regional yet. I'm sure that's coming. Um, but when, it, when we do have multiple regions, it's very similar to Cloud Functions. So each time we create a, uh, a deployment in Cloud Run, uh, essentially our app, then, then that runs in a specific region, so we need to have multiple ones. But at least we can have multiple Cloud Run apps or, or project uh, <laughs> deployments within a given project. So now for all of these options today, you have to use an external load balancer. So uh, the Apigee is a great option because that's something that is, is part of the Google family, just not fully integrated into like the Google console and that kind of thing yet. But great option, or you could use another load balancer as well. Um, so those are your options from the ser serverless side of things for how you go multi-regional. One thing to add here, uh, but we are working on a more Google Cloud native solution, load balancing solution for all of these. It's not there yet, but it's something that, that we are working on. But for now, you have to rely on something external like Apigee or Cloudflare or something like that. Yeah. And Apigee, um, I don't think I'll do justice to Apigee because it's such a complicated product. That I, but I only use a small part of that. But what is Apigee is that it, it used to be a separate company uh, that Google bought like two or three years ago. Uh, it's an API proxy, an API management tool. Um, so you can basically you know, set a proxy that points to either servers or points to like any endpoints running anywhere, not just on Google Cloud. And then you can set very complicated rules on those endpoints. So you can do pre-flows, which means when you, someone hits that endpoint, you can run some code. Then, then, it, then you can do post flows, where, which means that when someone comes out of the code, uh, you can do some complicated things. You can load balance between anything, really. Like any endpoint, you can load balance. Load balance. You can set pretty much any kind of rule you want on that. They have a really good developer console where you can visualize things and see how the traffic is flowing. You can even debug your endpoints from the console that I'm going to show. Uh, and there's many other things like machine learning intrusion detection and all like sorts of stuff that I haven't played with. But just know that it's, if you need any kind of API management, Apigee is a really great tool. Now, what I use it for is that you know, if we have App, App Engine applications and we have App Engine endpoints, uh, all I wanted to do is that I want to have a single endpoint where I can, load, but I can do geo load balancing. So if a user is in US West, I want them to go to US West App Engine. And if, if they're in Europe, I want them to go to Europe. So I, I just set that up with Apigee. And it was really easy and really intuitive. So let me just show you some of that. So this is the App Engine console. So it's a separate console. It's not part of Google Cloud. Um, so you have to work with that. And you can set many proxies that you want, API proxies. But here I have a proxy for my multi-regional app. 
And then what you can see is that um, there's prod and test, so you don't have to push everything to prod by default. You can test them out in the test environment. And once you're ready, you can push them to prod. And then under here, you can see the endpoints that we're exposing. So, so multi-region-atml is my base endpoint, but then slash GAE is my app engine endpoint, slash cloud run is my cloud run endpoint and stuff like that. So these are what's called proxy endpoints. I have a default one, and I also have specific ones for specific products like G, uh, app engine or cloud run or cloud functions. And then these proxy endpoints, they point to target endpoints. And these target endpoints, basically, they're things that you define. They can be some endpoints in Google Cloud or they can be endpoints anywhere, really. Um, the default one, um, by the way, this is the kind of UI part, but you can also switch to developer mode. And in developer mode, you can see things uh, in a way that makes more sense, at least to me, <laughs> in XML. Um, so for example, the default one, uh, I'm saying that it's a secure endpoint, meaning I'm going to use HTTPS. And my target endpoint is uh, default as well. If you look at the target endpoint, I have two servers defined, and I'm just run robining between them. So these servers, I defined what their IP is, what their port is, and it will run robin between them. If you look at the uh, app engine one, here I'm saying my base endpoint is slash GAE, and it's also a secure endpoint. And then my target endpoint is GAE Europe West and GAE US West 2. And I also have a condition, right? And in this condition, I'm saying that if the system has a region name that starts with Europe, then send it to Europe West. And if the system region name starts with US, send to US West. So that's how I'm, that's how I'm doing like geolog balancing with Apigee. And if you look at these target endpoints, uh, GAE Europe West, it's basically just my app engine and a URL. So this is a multi-region in Europe, and this is multi-region two, which is in the US. So that's how you set it up. And once you have that, um, you can also do tracing kind of things. Uh, maybe, but maybe I won't, yeah, I won't show that here because it's not showing up here. But basically, you can also trace these from the, the console and see how, where the request is going and which conditions are being met and stuff like that. But for some reason, it's not showing up here right now. The scale. Yeah, the scaling of this is a little bit weird. Yeah, so that's how you set things up. And I guess you can show us now yep. how it works in App Engine. Yeah, so it's uh, the App Engine side. So over in Google Cloud Console, I'll show you the App Engine parts of this. So if we go to App Engine, remember I can only have one App Engine app within a single uh, project. And so our project is this multi-regional AdML. And this is my App Engine app. And so we can go in and look at the services. I've got a service there with multiple versions. Took us a little bit of testing to get everything uh, up and running. And then underneath App Engine, um, we're using App Engine Flex. So there's actual instances underneath that as well. So these run uh, ultimately on GCE instances underneath the covers. Uh, so that's one app. If we can go just to actually load this thing and you can see it. So this is not going through the load balancer, just going direct to this particular application. So all the way to Belgium took uh, a round trip was 567 milliseconds, so pretty long there to get to Belgium and back. OK, so now to be multi-regional, we needed another project. So we can go select, whoops, Oops. oh, do not search the dictionary. There we go. Let's try this again. OK, so we've got another project here, multi-region 2 atml. And so now we're in the App Engine 1 for that. And we've configured this App Engine app to run in US West. And so if we go load that, then we get our uh, Los Angeles one there. Uh, so very similar. Same container image that this is based on. So, so same application underneath the covers. OK, so that's our App Engine. And then, of course, uh, we can go test out uh, the load balancer part of this as well. So if we go to our endpoint for our Apigee, then we're, remember, left is Belgium. So it routed us correctly to Belgium. And then if we load that same endpoint in from Oregon, then uh, you'll see that, um, I don't know why we picked uh, Los Angeles, but anyways, it's, uh, it's now going from Oregon, where, where the VM on the right is running, down to Los Angeles and back. So a little bit higher latency. Should be a little bit faster than that, but um, if we try it again, there we go. That's a little better. Um, so it did route us to the closest one. It didn't route us to Belgium, so that's good. Um, so there we go. That's, that's Apigee now running in front of the App Engine apps. <laughs>